no slush. Um, I'm going to do my talk in two parts. I'm going to explain what the problem is, and it's a big problem, and then I'm going to give a positive solution to, to how we solve that problem. So I'm not going to try and deal with all of the issues around uh, privacy and data, because that's a massive, massive job. But I'm going to explain how individuals can take back control of their most important personal data. OK, we do almost everything on the phone these days. And that means there's a lot of data. And sadly, with all of that data, it means there's a lot of fraudsters who are taking our data and putting it into websites on our behalf without our knowledge. And that's a big problem for websites, and it's a big problem for individuals. OK, that's just in the UK. About 4% of GDP, gross domestic product, people think is basically fraudulent transactions. That's a lot of cost in the web. Most people want better control of their data, but they don't want it to be really difficult to do. And that's always been a difficult problem to fix. So security and convenience is usually uh, too difficult for individuals to get a nice, easy way of being secure. OK, those six numbers are still the most popular password. So that convenience and security is well uh, kind of imaged there, that if you put that in as a password, there's a good chance a bot is going to put your email into the web and put the, that password in, and they're going to get into your account at some point. 90% of login attempts are no longer made by humans. That's a big, big problem. Yep, so if a bot already knows that you're using the same username and password at multiple websites, if they crack it at one website, it's in their interest to go around thousands, hundreds of thousands of websites and put it into those other websites. And eventually, they'll probably find that they can get in and take your account over. So none of us want to admit it, but lots of people are using easy passwords or the same passwords on multiple sites. We're putting more and more precious information onto websites, whether it be social media or into web forms. And we kind of partly have to do that to interact online, but it means there's a huge amount of data going into different websites, and lots of them are being hacked. OK, this is back in 1992, because uh, I'm quite old. And this is how you used to put information into the web. Now, luckily, the web has moved on a long, long way in the last uh, 25 years. So we've got some pretty cool things that have happened in that period. And obviously, with the web form, well, that hasn't changed at all. Yep, in 25 years, you've got exactly the same web form. You put your information in, or the fraudster puts your information in. And it's really, really difficult to stop somebody doing that. They've got lots of ways of finding your data, and they put it into the web form. They don't tell you, obviously. The website thinks that's cool. We've got a new customer. Yeah, they might check it against a database. If the information's correct, the database will say it's matched. I still don't know that it's me that's had this information put in. But effectively, it doesn't work. It's a broken system. And increasingly, it won't be a reliable way for businesses to think that they're interacting with a person. That's obviously something we've all heard about recently. So obviously, that's a very important website. It keeps a lot of precious information for all of us, or for certainly lots and lots of people. And unfortunately, it was hacked. So I'm never going to be able to change my date of birth. I'm probably not going to change my name, probably not going to change my address too often just because that information is now hacked and is sellable online. So I can't really do much about that. And that ends the first depressing part of my talk. Yeah, because these problems haven't gone away. And nobody's really solved how you can take back ownership of your data if lots and lots of other people have also got access to it. 
So we, three years ago, went out to lots of individuals and said, well, how do you think we could solve this? How, how would you like this to work? And actually, they told us pretty clearly what the solution was. And it's wrapped up in six words. So they said, we want to have a voluntary way of basically having our own digital identity. We want to own it. We want to control it. We don't want anybody else controlling it. We want to control it. We want it to be private, so nobody else can see what we're doing unless we choose to interact with them. And we want it, obviously, to be very secure. And last but not least, we need to be able to trust that that is how the solution will work. And a lot of people said, you know, it's a lovely, ideal way we'd like it to work. It's, it's basically how people trust that they can get into countries with this passport. But most said, you know, we don't think it's going to happen. So we spent the last three years working on that problem. And actually, those key messages that individuals gave us formed our principles as a business, which we wrote down literally in the first month or two of, of working in Yoti. And those principles are really important to us because we're dealing with some very difficult issues. And lots of people need to trust that if we're going to hold their personal data, that we're going to do that in a very responsible, trustworthy way. So those principles, I'm not going to go through them, but they're available on our website and they're very important to us. So the actual solution is Yoti, your own trusted identity. It's a free app, and it's very easy to create. So that's the big, big challenge normally with identity systems, but they're very expensive and difficult. People usually have to go to post offices and get out lots of forms, and that, of course, means nobody's really solved an online identity system because that's too expensive. So what we did was we said, right, let people do it at home in their pajamas. So all you need is your face, your unique phone, and you basically put your face in. We take a liveness video. You have to say three random words. We look at that with both machine and individual super recognizers. And we check that your face matches your photo ID. So with an Android phone, we can read, or you can choose to read, the chip in your passport, just like they do at the border control. You can do that. You only have to do it once. You do it in the privacy of your home with nobody watching. And then we check that that information matches. And if it does, that verified passport information is now unique to you on your unique phone. We then basically put all of the attributes in separate containers. And we put different keys to each one of those attributes. There's no relational database in Yoti. So your private key stays on your phone. And then that gets de-encrypted with a private key on our server. And then we basically allow you to get in just to your attributes. Nobody else can get into your attributes. Yoti can't get in to your attributes. Only the person who's got the biometrics and the phone can ever get into the attributes which they want to share. So those are the key kind of ingredients to a Yoti. And it's taken three years, because it's obviously a complicated thing to do under the bonnet. But actually, we knew if it needed to be a two or three minute experience for somebody as an individual. And that is a Yoti. Obviously, it's not my Yoti. Um, and that is a Yoti of somebody. You can use your Yoti in lots and lots of ways. So if I wanted to just prove that I'm 18 plus when I'm going into a nightclub, or 18 plus when I'm putting alcohol across a self-checkout in a supermarket, both real cases in the UK that you can use a Yoti for. Um, you can basically say to somebody you're thinking of buying a mountain bike off a website. You can say, well, look, I've got your mobile number, but I'd really like to know who you are. So send me your verified name. Fraudsters do not want to send verified names or pictures of their real biometrics to people they're going to defraud. It's quite a simple kind of issue. That's not what you want to do if you're a fraudster. So the fraudster will give some kind of reason why he doesn't want to use a Yoti to do it. 
the person will say, well, you know, that's not very trustworthy, particularly as Yoti's free and you're selling stuff. So effectively, an honest seller can easily give some confidence and a fraudster is going to think, oh, I need to go somewhere else where people don't ask me to use Yoti because I don't want to share my Yoti if I'm a fraudster. So there's lots and lots of ways that you can use Yoti in lots of different sectors. We have a password manager as well, so you can immediately get wide utility out of Yoti where you effectively don't even have to put your photo ID in. You just have the basic Yoti, and then like LastPass, you can keep your passwords in our vault and then use them to log into websites. So these are some of the things that on the Yoti identity platform you can do. You can sign password connections, authentication, verification. We've been really blown away with how many people have started to use Yoti. So we were in beta for most of this year. We had about 60,000 people use it in beta. And then in the last two months, we had 45,000 people install. And then last month just ended, we had 60,000. So lots and lots of people have told us over the last three years that they'd like to use Yoti. And that appears to be the case now that we've put it into the app stores. We've also made it incredibly easy for websites and developers to use Yoti. So there's seven SDKs. It takes one to three hours to securely integrate with Yoti, and some big companies have already done that. And then you can also download it in plugin form. So WordPress, Joomla, Drupal, particularly popular websites. And you know, if you'd like to talk to me at some point afterwards about Yoti, I'd love to talk to you. Thank you very much.